Okay, let's look a little further into the latest on the NDIS Australia. There are more people going to be on. Bill Shorten, welcome to the program. Will Good NDIS morning. participants have less choice and control under these changes? No, not at all. Listen, I, I couldn't help but obviously listen to the analysis of the panel. I just, there are three or four things which we've just got to get straight here from the outset. There are more people going to be on the scheme this week than there were last week. We will invest more in people with disability on the scheme this week than last week. What we're going to see with this legislation is returning the scheme to its original intent. The reality is that for nine years before I became the Minister, uh, people with disability were a secondary consideration in the NDIS. The scheme is changing lives. I mean, I guess, why on earth would your panel talk about good news? That's not what sells. But there's a lot of good news in this scheme. Uh, but the problem is, when I became Minister, I realised that things were far worse than could possibly be imagined. Uh, there are too many uh, service providers who are rorting and overcharging. That's not the majority of service providers, mm. but the reality is that there were some individuals making a lot of money out of the scheme and outcomes and needs of people with disability were being ignored. But I do not agree that the few people you heard there represent the entire voice of all 661,000 people and their families and 400,000 people working in the industry. We have been working on this legislation and the uh, case for it really since day one, two and a half years ago. For as many people who say this legislation's rushed, half of people say, why don't we just get on with stuff? So we had hmm. the biggest review talking to people with disability that we've ever seen. 10,000 people, uh, thousands of submissions. Uh, I've done 18 town halls personally with tens of thousands of people present, uh, both online. And what we want to do is make sure that the scheme is there for future generations. But we're also making sure that people know what they can spend their money on. I mean, the greatest fiction mm. that I've heard is that somehow this government's invented a list of what you can spend your money on. There's always been a list. Well, I'll come I to think, that. There's always yeah. been a list of reasonable and necessary principles, not a list of what you can and can't no, specifically. That's not right. there's, no, that's not right, David. There's been operational guidelines in the agency. Yeah, guidelines. Now we're talking about yeah, but what you can and can't. Yeah, but it's not a specific list that articulates no, no, what actually, you can and can't. Actually, let's clear it up right now. You practically the problem with the one of the problems for the NDIS is you practically need a PhD in its language. Mm -hmm. It's such a jargon-heavy issue. There's been operational guidelines saying what planners are allowed to give people and let them spend their money on what they're not. Mm. Uh, but the problem is those lists have been ignored sometimes and so most so people not, are doing not, the right thing. <clears throat> you're not seriously saying those guidelines are the same as the list that you've now put out? Yeah, pretty much, yeah, I am. All right, well, this, this, this new list, it's a draft list at the moment. Well, it's... no, no, again, we're going to just correct the language here. It's a list which has the weight of a parliamentary regulation sure. now. It's been been an operational guideline but you know this is the Greens have just caused more misinformation and anxiety raising I mean they've never seen a political challenge in Australia where they don't want to just cause anxiety and I get that the disability sector does not want to go back but this government had three options scrap it a la the Koori doctrine do nothing a la the Green doctrine or just make it better outcomes for people with more clarity in, in fairness to uh, Phil, I don't think he's saying scrap this. No, scheme, no, no, no. That just on the list, just to pick up on the list. The panel so this, this new list now says that you can't, for example, um, claim for a washing machine or a dishwasher. Some of the participants are worried about that. They point out people with a disability often do need particularly specialised equipment. So is it a guideline or is it a hard and fast rule? How, how will this work? Well, the problem in the past is it's just been a guideline, so it's been interpreted differently by different people. When we give it the force of a regulation, it becomes easier to enforce. And so it is, to, it is, is, well, it is well, going to be enforced in a new Let's use two examples, way. washing machines and dishwashers. The Act says, uh, and the Act has always said, that if services are provided by m mainstream systems, it's not something the NDIS does. But in addition, what we've said is there are things which you can set, spend your supports on which are reasonable and necessary and mm -hmm. give you choice and control. Um, with our household items, there are some household items which can be modified to make it easier for a person with a disability to use. They'll still be allowed. But this idea that, and I just want to clear up, that everyone can head down to Bingley or, um, or Harvey Norman and get yourself a washing machine on the scheme, 
that's not right and that's never been so, right. So, okay, to be clear, you can still apply for a if particular the, washing machine. It's in the substitute. Well, I don't know about washing machines and your particular disability, but what I do know is that if you have a particular need, uh, and it, the item is not on the list, but that it, there's a way which it uh, supports you with your disability, well, then there'll be a substitution provision allowed. That's okay. in the Act. There is more misinformation being peddled by the extremists. I mean, really, my challenge back to that, to, you know, to, mm -hmm. to the Green political party and, and the others causing this fear and misinformation is... Your plan was to keep driving past the rorts. Your plan was to keep ignoring the lack of a payment system. Well, let's talk about your plan. Because the explanatory memorandum to your bill suggests there aren't special circumstances for things on this list. This morning no, you're, have a look at, you're have saying a look there at the are. Word sub, there's a substitution clause. OK, so just to be clear for people, because a lot of people have raised these issues about the list, there's substitution clauses for everything on the list? Well, there's a substitution clause not for everything on the list, but for people's individual needs. Right. Like, again, um, but someone said, oh, this legislation's been rushed. The legislation was presented on March the 29th. But you made changes just the other day to it to get yes, it through Yes, but the let's, let's go to that issue of making changes. If we hadn't changed anything, we'd be accused of being arrogant. But somehow if we make changes, that's also... like. Where, where, where's the fine line here? It's invisible to the naked eye. The reality is that we listen to the states and territories and we improve their co-governance protection. Okay. But I just want to be clear on this. If there's, if there's someone who looks at that list, they're worried, there is a substitution clause, you're saying, that they can apply and say, I need that for my disability. Based on individual circumstances. And they can what we're still not get it. Do. Here's okay. a classic, let me use a classic example. You might need um, a smartwatch because it sort of regulates your temperature. You've got a particular condition that, you know, if your temperature starts really fluctuating, you're in trouble. That's fine. Come and talk to the agency about that. But we're not going to say everyone gets a smartwatch. And somewhere along the line, as we talk about change, I respect that people with disability are anxious, but this, we're budgeting going forward that this scheme will increase in cost. But there is a problem out there, and mm. most people watching this show know it. Some service providers have been having a lend of it. There has been price inflation. And you know that's payment systems. We've now legislated for the first time a payment system. We haven't even had the ability to investigate invoices. Mm. Uh, and so we're seeing rorts. And, and if, someone, guess, if someone wrongly uh, buys something, claims something, they can now be issued with a debt. Is there the capacity to appeal against that? Yeah. Like, first of all, there's always been provisions against people wrongly claiming. Mm -hmm. What we're actually doing is making sure that people know what they can claim and not claim beforehand. A trip to Japan is not allowed. Sure, um, but the dishwasher or washing machine example. I get some of these, I, you know, some of these examples are extreme, a trip to Japan. Well, sorry, you're using examples one way. I guess I'm the one who sees, do you know, there's 400,000 transactions a day mm. which we pay on okay. the scheme. The question was, if they're issued a debt, can they appeal that? Yes, but okay. what's more? No, but let's go further. The current Act wouldn't take into account one of the grounds for a waiver of the debt being uh, a person's disability. We've put that in. So we're actually being okay. a lot more realistic about the real world. But the truth of the matter is that we've seen what we call uh, plans being exhausted prematurely. If you get a two-year plan and all of a sudden a plan is exhausted in the first five weeks because some intermediary mm. said spend your money, it'll be automatically topped up. The See, other... my, obli my obligation is to everyone who's doing the right thing on the scheme. The dilemma with this reform is as simple as this. We just need to tell the truth. The truth is this scheme's very good. It's the best in the world, and we are investing more in people with disability. The but other the truth concern... is also it's not working properly mm. for some people, so we need better decision making. And there are rorts and shonks going on, and just because some people don't want me to talk about it, I will. The other concern that's been raised this week is about the shift from unregistered to registered providers. Yeah. You know, some people say, look, I'm very comfortable with the person who comes and helps me get out of bed, shower, whatever it is. I don't want to go with a new person I don't know. Sure. Well, we're not automatically... We're not going to change that. But on the other hand, what's wrong with asking that everyone who's driving someone, that we see their driver's licence and that they've got car insurance? What's wrong with asking that if you're going to work with kids, that you've got a working with children's check? In fact, what's wrong with asking, are you a real person and do you exist? What, I mean, the reality is that we... Um, the, the, the Fraud Fusion Task Force, which I set up earlier in my piece, 
investigated the uh, 900 of the smallest plan managers. These are people who manage people's plans. They gave the anonymised data to the Australian Tax Office. 343 or so came back. Mm. They've never declared any income. So I, we don't have a system in Australia where you can choose to have a driver's licence or not. The registration will be principles-based. Uh, we've released it. It's been commissioned by a human rights lawyer, uh, commissioned by me using human rights lawyer Natalie Wade. Right. It'll be light, medium and heavy. But if you're doing complicated tasks which go to people's safety, I want to make sure that the person doing it can okay. actually do that job. You've already made some savings through the crackdown on fraud and so on over the last financial year. I think $600 million was the, the latest figure of savings that you've found. You've got some new figures that'll come out a little later this week, I think. Will it be more than $600 million? Yeah, I think the budget forecast for the uh, scheme was $42.4 billion. I'm optimistic that just because we're running the scheme better and more transparently, we're eliminating some of that bloated waste. And so I'm optimistic it might even come in with uh, a lower figure, a, a better figure than 600 million less than we foresaw. But before you start, before I start getting SMSs and trolled by a sort of very active minority, this is not a cut. The reality is that last year the scheme cost in the mid towards the 35, 36 billion dollars. It's still going to cost more this year. Under the Liberals in their last year, the scheme grew by 23 per cent in cost and 15 per cent more participants. What we've managed to do, even without this legislation, is the number of participants growing in the scheme has gone up by 8%. Mm. And the, uh, the cost of the scheme's growth is still too high at 18%. We're just running the scheme better with better people. Yeah. But, are you, but are you, I mean, the savings no doubt have, have come through some of those crackdowns. But well, cost the, the, reductions, yeah. The, the latest quarterly report also shows some sharp drops on performance. Uh, the number of plans approved on time fell yeah. from just over 50% to about 23%. The number of plan amendments done on time fell from 63 to 39%. Is a that... simple explanation for that, David. What's happened is the, um, some of the people who have been living high on the hogs, some of the uh, service providers and some of the intermediaries, and there are very good providers intermediaries, let me say, before they bomb me with their texts, they've, the word's out. This is not going to be the easy ride that it once was with a lack of scrutiny. And so we've been flooded with a whole lot of uh, variations and claims, which has increased the overall number by about 100%. So, yes, what that means is that it's taking us longer to process them because we're getting a whole lot of extra claims because people realise that it's the end of the free drinks. Uh, and so that will invariably affect weight. That's so true. People realise that this is all going to get harder, so they put... I said this had happened. ...in times, but all of that will trend down in the next quarter. All right. The foundational supports, uh, we talked about those a little earlier. They're due to start July next year. Uh, you know, mm. Kids in particular with uh, autism or developmental delays that don't end mm. up on the NDIS. That's not far off, 10 months until they're due to start. Can you, can you tell us what they're going to look like Who's going to decide who goes under what scheme? How far along are these plans? Well, language is important. And um, some of the people who have been scaremongering obviously don't give us stuff about causing anxiety, but I'm not going to be one of them. So you said in that opening question uh, that we're introducing foundational support so kids don't end up on the NDIS. At the moment... No, I said four, four kids who don't end up on the NDIS. OK, sorry, I'm glad I clarified that then. So... When your precious child has a non-standard developmental journey, at the moment, the option is sort of NDIS or nothing. What we want to do is build out a menu of support. See, one of the problems with the NDIS is it sort of pays for hours of individual service uh, and families have been forgotten. So we want to, foundational supports might include, for example, building more peer-to-peer -peer family supports. Nothing is better for a family with a child with a non-standard developmental journey than talking to another mm. family who's been through the same thing. So who's going to decide um, which one they go on? Well, first of all, what we want to do is introduce uh, lead practitioners uh, where when you've got a question, often when you've got a new baby or a new family, who do you go to? At least for, you, you know, in Australia we've had maternal and child health nurses for sort of some yeah. issues. So the reviews recommend that we develop lead practitioners so you can go to uh, someone and just say, all right, this is my beautiful child, where do you recommend? Right. But what we also need to do other than just have navigators and lead practitioners who could be embedded in the community, um, then you need to know what their options are. 
Amanda Rishworth, my colleague, the Minister for Social Services, is working uh, day in, day out with the states to develop a range of early intervention services uh, outside the scheme, because not every child needs the full NDIS right. service. But my message to this is, I want to leave yeah. the politicians and the Greens and all the other sort of social media warriors out of the way. My message to parents is this. If your child needs the NDIS, you're going to get it. I've spent my whole 17 years in Parliament fighting for the NDIS, and the reason why perhaps I've sounded a little passionate today is I listen to the people who say, do nothing, change is too hard. These people are dangerous, because if we don't do something about the cost growth, there will be no NDIS. OK. Look, uh, I, we could keep going on the NDIS, and we'll talk more about it, I'm sure, between uh, now and the start of July. Just sure, I, I want to get you on a few other things, if I can. Um, in